Jiko Levine, who's in the gallery. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Keza Dugdale. Do you ask the First Minister, other than the important matter of the tennis, what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland and hopefully, fingers crossed, celebrating an Andy Murray victory in the tennis. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. On the 25th of February last year, the Schools Minister, Alistair Allen, said that a small minority of pupils would be sitting the old hire this year. This week, we learnt that almost half of Scotland's pupils will be sitting the old hire. What's gone wrong? First Minister. Uh, nothing has gone wrong. What has happened is that teachers have been given the flexibility, I think the flexibility in the timetable for delivery of Curriculum for Excellence that Kezia Dugdale once uh, asked for. Curriculum for Excellence is founded on professional judgment and it's right that decisions take account of local circumstances. Schools are able to use this flexibility to phase in the new qualifications in the way that best serves the interests of pupils. And this flexibility was warmly welcomed when it was given by teacher unions and indeed by opposition politicians. This is the only year in which dual running of the exams will be permitted. Uh, but given the importance of ensuring proper implementation, I thought that would have been something that Kezia Dugdale and her colleagues yeah, would have welcomed. Yeah, yeah. Kezia <clears throat> I would, President Officer, except it was Mike Russell who told this chamber that I do not believe that any teacher in Scotland who has the right support, the right help and the right leadership cannot rise to the challenge and deliver the conclusion of a programme that has been eight years in the making. There is real concern from parents, teachers and pupils across Scotland. And we know that from the past, when there is a problem in our education system, it's the kids from the poorest backgrounds who suffer the most. It's worrying that the schools minister clearly didn't know what was going on with the higher system, Hopefully the First Minister will know what's going on with the appeal system. Last year, the SNP government started to charge for exam appeals. Freedom of information responses to Scottish Labour show that for state pupils, the money for an appeal must come from either the school budget or the council budget. And we all know that money is tight. But for private school pupils, parents can pay for the appeals themselves. Can the First Minister tell us whether the number of exam appeals from state school pupils has gone up or down in the last year? First Minister. Consistency clearly isn't Labour's strong suit this week. On the issue of dual running of exams... Oh, the well, Labour has raised, I think, an important question for pupils and for parents across the country. So let me give an answer to the question, but I think it is worth pointing out that it's not that long ago, uh, the 12th of September 2014 to be precise, when Kezia Dugdale said that the timescale for implementation of the new exams was too fast. She said the timetable was ridiculous. And she then cited the introduction of standard grades and said that had been over 10 years, presumably implying that she thought that was a more appropriate timescale for the implementation of these new exams. And now that we are seeing teachers and schools using the flexibility that they have been rightly given, Kezia Dugdale turned round and says the implementation timetable is too slow. It almost puts the hypocrisy on fracking into the shade. Signing <laughs> officer, let me... Kezia Dugdale wants to quote Order. teachers. So let me quote Larry Flanagan, the General Secretary, of the EIS. He said, this is a sensible approach that will enable teachers to use their best judgment in deciding which option is in the best interests of their pupils. If that's what teachers have to say, then I don't really quite know why Kezia Dugdale takes a different view. On the issue of uh, appeals, uh, we, we have put in place a system that is right and proportionate in terms of appeals to give young people the best opportunity of fulfilling their potential at school. Now, I've said previously on a whole range of subjects, if on this issue Kezia Dugdale wants to bring forward some suggestions for improvements, I'll be willing to listen. But not for the first time. I'll be waiting a long, long time for Labour to come up with anything constructive. Yeah. Kezia Dugdale. 
President, officer, the First Minister wants to quote Larry Flanagan. I can play that game. He said that the appeal should be based upon the professional judgment of teachers rather than on the wishes of parents. And what is now happening is fundamentally wrong. Fundamentally. The First Minister doesn't have a clue what the answer to my question was, so let me tell her. The reality is, is that since the SNP started to charge, the number of state school pupils' appeals has fallen by 55,000. Even if you factor in the fall in the number of exams, that's a drop of more than 75% in just one year. President officer, good exam results can be the difference between a pupil going on to university or not. And for disadvantaged kids in particular, this can be a deal breaker. So let me ask the First Minister another question. Since the SNP started charging for appeals, has the number of appeals from private school kids fallen at a faster or slower rate than for state school pupils in Scotland? First Minister, I'm surprised that Kezia Dugdale doesn't want to focus on what I thought would be the real success story, not of government, Order. not of government, but of pupils across the country. Mr. There Findlay. was a record in 2014. There was a record number of higher passes in Scotland, almost 4,000 more than in 2013. We're introducing, and we're introducing rightly and properly, curriculum for excellence and a new system of exams. And yes, changes to the way in which uh, appeals are applied for and processed. We will continue to make sure that we respond to the experience of all of that so that we continue to do what we have been doing each and every year we have been in government. And that is taking the action that needs to be taken to ensure that our young people get the best possible education and get the best possible chance to pass the exams that give them the best chance in life. There was a day, there was a day when Labour would have supported that, but as on so many other issues, Labour has moved beyond and away from its very basic principles. Once again, President Officer, the First Minister hasn't got a clue. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The, the truth is that the proportion of appeals from privately educated pupils is now double that of state kids. The system now favours private school pupils more than ever before. Parents of private school pupils can buy their kids a second chance. Parents of private school pupils can put their hands in their pocket to help their kids, but state school pupils can't. It's no wonder that just 220 kids from the poorest background in Scotland get the grades needed to make it to our top universities. President officer, the SNP's record on educational inequality is clear for all to see. Teacher numbers down by more than 4,000. Appeals for state pupils plummeting by 55,000. Kids from the poorest backgrounds being left behind. People in Scotland simply want to know, is this the fairer Scotland the First Minister promised? First Minister. In actual fact... Order. In actual fact... Uh, in spite of what Kezia Dugdale has just said, 18-year-olds from the most disadvantaged areas are more likely to be accepted to university Absolutely. under the SNP. Absolutely. UCAS stats show that the percentage of 18-year-olds from the most disadvantaged areas accepted to university is up from 6.4% under Labour to 8.9% oh. in 2013, oh. an increase of 2.5 oh. percentage now. points. Now, can I say very clearly to this entire chamber and to this entire country that I don't think that's good enough. I want to see more children, more young people from our most disadvantaged backgrounds getting the same kind of opportunities I got as a young person to go to university. That's why in my programme for government I set the goal of increasing the number of people from our most deprived areas who do get to go to university. But that's why we are working to ensure, firstly, the best possible school education for our young people. And I repeat what I said earlier, we're seeing a record number of higher passes. And it's also why this party unlike the Labour Party, has worked so hard and will continue to work so hard to protect free higher education for our young people. Because if Labour had their way in introducing tuition fees, it would be a lot harder for our poorest young people to get the chance I had to go to university. Question two, Ruth Davidson. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to invite the First Minister to join with me in congratulating Andy Murray, who's just won his uh, Australian Open semi-final in the last few minutes, uh, and to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. I hope uh, Ruth Davidson wasn't looking at Twitter in the Chamber, <laughs> Presiding Officer. Oh, no. Can I? I think Jackson Carlaw might be in some trouble. <laughs> Can I take the opportunity to congratulate Andy Murray on his semi-final win? And I'm sure on behalf of everybody in this chamber, we could have an outbreak of consensus and wish him all the best for the yeah. final on Sunday. <laughs> Planning officer, I... I will meet the Secretary of State on Monday at the Oil and Gas Summit in Aberdeen and I will take the opportunity there to again call for the UK Government to take immediate action to cut the supplementary charge for the oil and gas sector instead of waiting seven long weeks until the UK budget. Ruth Davidson. Thank you very much. Um, Presiding officer, when this SNP Government defended its massive cuts to college courses, the former Education Secretary said, and I quote, there were bluntly too many hobby courses and far too few courses were focused on employment. Well, presiding officer, there is one group of courses which is geared specifically towards employment. They're called STEM courses and they take in science, technology, engineering and maths. Can the First Minister tell us whether the number of students on further education STEM courses has gone up or down on the SNP's watch? First Minister. Well, New figures, uh, well, figures show that the vision we've set for the college sector is one focused on skills for work and economic growth is paying dividends. Uh, Ruth Davidson rightly says that the changes we've been making to the college sector are designed to ensure that people going to college come out of college with qualifications that are able to help them get into work. Now, I'm happy to uh, discuss with Ruth Davidson any particular aspects of our approach to colleges that she thinks we should be looking to improve, and I say that in a genuine spirit of consensus. But I am proud of the fact I am proud of the fact that we are taking the action, often the tough action, that is making college education more productive for our young people. Ruth Davidson. Presenting officer, I asked her about student numbers, and the First Minister knows the number that I asked. She just doesn't want to say the number that I asked. It was published by her government this week. When the SNP came to power, there were over 86,000 college places in STEM subjects. The most recent figure is just 56,000. A cut of 30,000 places in science, in technology, in engineering and in maths. And this government is failing on science and maths because they're college courses that lead to jobs and they've been slashed by a third. In schools, less than half of science and maths pupils will actually sit the new exams this year, as we've just heard. And in the international tables, on every measurement since this government came to power, Scotland has gone backwards in both science and in maths. Presiding officer, our young people need the skills to compete. Getting a decent job depends on it. So why is this government failing them? First Minister. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to look in detail at the figures uh, Ruth Davidson has quoted, and I'm more than happy uh, to do that and to uh, respond. But can I, can I say... Well, Labour clearly finds the issue of education amusing. I actually find Order. it very serious. In the, year, in the year of the most recent figures that we have available, approximately 14,000 more students successfully completed courses leading to recognised qualifications than was the case in the year 2008 and 9. That is an increase of 33%. We're also seeing the average hours of learning per student increase. Uh, back in 2006-07, that was less than 250 hours. That's now up to almost 400 uh, hours. And we have, as we committed to doing in our manifesto, maintained the number of places in Scotland's colleges. And the number of students achieving HNC, HNDs, uh, which are qualifications both recognised and valued by employers is up 36%. The number getting degrees is up 121%. Now, I think that is something to be celebrated. 
On the issue of STEM subjects in particular, one of the things uh, I would certainly readily uh, agree with is that we need to get more girls and women into STEM subjects. So I don't, I don't stand here, I don't stand here and take the view that we have done everything we need to do. But we are doing the hard work to make sure that our colleges are equipped to give young people the preparation they need for the workplace, and we will continue to focus on doing that. I can start with the question, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Sir. The announcement by Tesco yesterday to close Kirkcaldy store is not only devastating news for the employees, but will have a huge impact on the surrounding area. Can the First Minister tell me what assistance the Scottish Government can give to 189 employees who now face losing their jobs? First Minister. Um, can I uh, thank the member for the question and firstly uh, say that I, my thoughts are with all of those affected by the announcement made by Tesco yesterday. The Deputy First Minister spoke to uh, the Council in uh, respect of the Kirkcaldy store this morning and gave a commitment that the Scottish Government will work with the Council to do everything we can to support affected employees. And of course, uh, PACE uh, has already been in contact with Tesco to offer support for employees who may be facing redundancy and information on PACE has been provided to the company. We do understand that the company will seek to minimise redundancies through redeployment and alternative roles within Tesco, uh, but PACE representatives will work with Tesco to provide a tailored package of support to minimise the time those affected by redundancy are out of work. Question three, Liam MacArthur. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what progress has been made in implementing the recommendations in Jackie Brock's report on closing the gaps in the child protection process. First Minister. Uh, the Government welcomes the Brock report and we have accepted all of its recommendations. We are implementing the 12 recommendations that were made, including holding a National Strategic Leadership Summit next month. Uh, the report was one strand of a wider programme to ensure Scotland's approach to safeguarding children and young people continues to be as robust as possible. Uh, a parliamentary briefing note on the progress of the Scottish Government's response to the Brock report will be available from SPICE today and we will continue to act decisively to implement the recommendations that were laid out in the report. Liam MacArthur. Can I thank the First Minister for the response? She refers to the summit, but the truth is that Mike Russell promised this chamber that he would hold that summit by the end of last year. That did not happen. Those who have suffered the harrowing experience of child sexual exploitation are owed nothing less than robust and urgent action. Jackie Brock knows that. That is why she has felt moved to express her frustration at the lack of progress by the Scottish Government in taking forward the recommendations contained in the Brock report. Isn't it the case that the Government has taken its eye off the ball on this vital issue? And will the First Minister now commit to taking the decisive action the survivors of child exploitation expect, and which we were promised back in November last year? First Minister. Uh, no, that's not true, and I don't think it's a fair characterisation. Uh, the Government, and I'm sure every single member of this chamber, is absolutely resolute uh, in our determination to do everything that we need to do to protect children and to protect our most vulnerable children. As I've said, we have accepted all of the 12 recommendations of the Brock report. The summit that has been referred to, as I said in my initial answer, will take place next month. Uh, of course, the Brock report was just one strand of a wider programme of work, which of course included uh, the full Child Sexual Exploitation Action Plan, which was published on the same day as the Brock report. Uh, that uh, was the result of work established in April 2013. It was developed over 19 months by a team of experts, including children's charities, child protection experts, uh, and the police and social work, and it, it drew on a full committee inquiry into the issue. So we will take forward all of these recommendations. I hope we will do so with a considerable degree of cross-party support uh, to make sure that we are taking the action we need to take to protect our vulnerable young people. Ian Gray. The Brock report explicitly pointed out the vulnerability of on-the-radar children to sexual exploitation, citing the Rotherham case. This week, police launched a probe into 14 cases of child sexual exploitation here in Edinburgh. The urgency of this could not be greater. It is a week now since Jackie Brock told us there had been little or no activity since her report. Can the First Minister tell us what she has done in the past week to redouble efforts in this area? First Minister. 
Uh, as I said in my initial answer, there is an update available to all members in SPICE today which sets out the actions we are taking as a result of the Brock report and indeed, as I have already said, that is part of a wider uh, suite of action that we are taking. Uh, Ingrid, uh, references police investigations clearly as I'm sure he understands I cannot comment on ongoing police investigations but of course the action plan uh, that I've already referred to does complement the wider action that we're taking including uh, the wider action around uh, the establishment of a new specialist police unit. Uh, police Scotland have formed a new national child abuse investigation unit uh, that was announced in October last year and that announcement and that unit will enable the police to play their full part in making sure that we're protecting uh, children and protecting uh, our young people. We've also, as the Chamber is well aware, strengthened child protection legislation and policy. The Children and Young People Bill uh, has received royal assent and that act strengthens the protection of children's rights. It creates a statutory single point of contact for raising concerns, the named person. Uh, and obviously we saw a, a court judgment uh, just in the last few days on that particular issue. And it requires all agencies to work together in the child's best interest. So, presiding officer, we will continue to do everything we possibly can to protect children, to protect the most vulnerable children and to protect uh, children uh, who are vulnerable to sexual exploitation. Uh, I uh, genuinely uh, say that we will listen to ideas and suggestions from wherever they might come because on this issue, perhaps more than on any other issue, we should come together as one parliament determined to do what needs to be done. Question four, Mark MacDonald. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update on the work of the Energy Jobs Task Force? First Minister. Uh, well, I very much welcome the constructive discussions and the actions which came out of the first meeting of the Energy Jobs Task Force, which was held yesterday in Aberdeen. The meeting saw a group from across the public and private sectors come together quickly to reinforce the determination of industry to ensure that Scotland retains the skills and talent which support the sector at home and overseas. A range of ideas were considered by the task force and immediate action will be taken to translate this into tangible outcomes, including a large-scale PACE market event to match those facing redundancy with opportunities elsewhere. It's also been agreed that the task force will convene monthly with the next meeting scheduled for the 26th of February. Mark MacDonald. Can I thank the First Minister for her answer? I uh, note she says the task force will look at opportunities elsewhere. One example might be North East Scotland College, which has recently struggled to recruit lecturers for its oil and gas skills courses, and there may be beneficial opportunities uh, amidst the recent spate of redundancies. Uh, can I also ask the First Minister if she shares the disappointment that is being expressed in the North East that the UK Government, who hold the fiscal powers, look set to wait until the budget in March to make any interventions, and will she continue to press for early interventions to support the industry and the workforce? First Minister. Uh, well, I certainly share Mark Macdonald's uh, views on what I think the UK Government should be doing right now, which is not waiting to the budget, but acting with tax changes now. And as I said, in response to Ruth Davidson, uh, that's a, an argument that I will make again on Monday at the Oil and Gas Summit. Uh, I think Mark Macdonald also makes uh, some very reasonable points around North East Scotland College. And you know, I think it's important to emphasise that the aim of the task force is to safeguard the decades of skills and experience that have been built up within the oil and gas industry. And this will include and necessitate close working with colleges and universities. And that's why the Scottish Funding Council is represented on the task force. Andrew Fraser. Uh, thank you. The First Minister will know that the Scottish Conservatives uh, support further reductions in North Sea oil and gas taxation, and we ha have already made that case to the Chancellor. But Sir Ian Wood has stated that any reduction in taxes will make no difference to the situation over the next six to nine months. So what additional action will the Scottish Government be taking now to assist the sector? First Minister. Well, I've just outlined uh, some of the work we're doing through the Jobs Task Force. I've made very clear that is the key intervention, uh, which supplements the work that we would do uh, routinely to support the sector through skills support, innovation support, support for the sector in uh, exporting. Uh, but the Jobs Task Force is designed to do three things in particular. Firstly, to work to maintain jobs and skills as far as possible. Secondly, to provide targeted support to those who are facing redundancy. Uh, and thirdly, to support better collaboration across the industry. Uh, the task force, which met yesterday for the first time, heard a number of ideas which will now be turned into a tangible action plan. And I would hope that Murdo Fraser and others uh, will get behind that. 
Finally, in respect of Ian Wood, I, I spoke uh, to Ian Wood uh, last of the week before last, and he made the point, and I think it's the point that underpins what we are calling for in terms of UK government action. Companies are making decisions now, and therefore they need now the clarity for the medium to long term in terms of the tax regime that they're going to be operating in. And that is why it is so important that we don't see a wait of seven weeks to the budget. It's why we should see that action now. And I would hope that uh, the Scottish Conservatives would perhaps uh, speak a bit more loudly in calling for their colleagues in Westminster to take the sensible action. Yeah, yeah. Question five, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that science lessons in schools are being underfunded by £8 million per year. First Minister. Well, we continue to see a very strong picture on science in our schools with increased higher entries across the three main science subjects since 2006 and pass rates remaining high. Uh, we do not agree that school science is underfunded. Uh, the Learner Societies Group on Scottish Science Education report looked at approximately 2% of primary schools and 13% of secondary schools. The report itself indicates that the findings should be treated with some caution. Indeed, that's borne out by looking at international comparisons where we see Scotland is above the OECD average for science as measured by the PISA rankings. Mark Griffin. Given that the First Minister has questioned the small sample size, will she um, listen to the evidence that the Learned Society gave to the Education and Culture Committee um, this week, um, where they asked the government to take their, far, their work forward, carry out a full um, independent audit of schools in Scotland to make sure that our pupils have the right equipment that they need to learn the practical science skills that colleges, universities and employers are looking for. First Minister. Well, I'm very happy to work, uh, to work with the Leonard Society's group in order to make sure that we build on the work that we're already doing to improve uh, science learning and teaching. I, I was struck by uh, one thing in particular that Dr Bill Beveridge, who gave evidence uh, on behalf of the societies to the committee this week, said, he said the basic knowledge of the science subjects, I think, has been taught well, and I think lots of pupils are seeing positive benefits from studying uh, the sciences. So we will continue to uh, work with uh, all those with an interest to make sure that we uh, improve our performance even further. Uh, indeed, straight after FMQs today, I'm going to present certificates to this year's winners of the Higgs Prize. The Higgs Prize, which of course bears the name of uh, Professor Peter Higgs, the Nobel Prize winner, is designed and was introduced by this government to motivate and inspire young physicists in our schools. So that's one example of the work that the Scottish Government is doing and I hope the Chamber would welcome it. Question six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with NHS boards regarding the reported reduction in funding for mental health research. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government direct funding for mental health research uh, through grants uh, awarded by three sources, direct funding through grants awarded by the Scottish Government, direct funding of the Scottish Mental Health Research Network and grants awarded to Scottish researchers by the UK Government's Department of Health National Institute of Health Research uh, Funding Committees. This has seen rises in mental health research funding under this government, when you take these th three strands together, uh, from around a million pounds in 2006-07 uh, to nearly four million pounds in 2014-15. Ms. Smith, uh, thank you, uh, First Minister, for that answer. Actually, it was revealed that there has been actually an 85% drop in funding for mental health research in the last eight years of the SNP government. Today, in the Scotsman, the Scottish Children's Services Coalition repeats its warning of two years ago that the number of educational psychologists is dangerously low. And on the 9th of July last year, they warned the then Health Secretary, Alex Neil, that there remains a large number of unfilled vacancies for trainee psychiatrists. Does the First Minister agree with those health professionals who say that the Scottish Government's complacency on mental health issues is unacceptable? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is not complacent in any way, shape or form when it comes to mental health. We uh, announced in November last year additional investment of £15 million over the next three years to improve mental health services. Uh, we are taking a range of action to make sure that we are reducing waiting times for access to psychological therapies and particularly for access to mental health treatment services for children and adolescents. Um, I think I'm happy to make uh, these figures available to Liz Smith and indeed to anybody else who is interested in seeing them. Uh, I think the report that Liz Smith uh, has referred to looked at, uh, as, if I understand it correctly, two out of the three strands 
of funding that I referred to in my initial answer. It looked at funding from the Chief Scientist Office Committees and funding for the Mental Health uh, Research Network. What it didn't uh, include was the funding that comes through the National Institute of Health Research uh, Funding Committees. And of course, Scottish researchers can apply to that because the Chief Scientist Office pays around nine million annually into the pot of funding. And when you take the three strands Together, as I said, uh, funding for mental health research goes from, in 2006-07, just over a million uh, pounds to, in 2014-15, just under four million pounds. That's the reality, and I'm happy to make those figures available. Dr Simpson. Uh, can I, first of all, thank the government for providing me with the answer, which was the basis of Liz Smith's question. What it demonstrated, however, was that the funding which she refers to is UK funding, largely. <laughs> And that, the, and that the Scottish funding demonstrates, does she not agree, a total lack of leadership on mental health research. Yes. First Minister. Well, clearly Labour hasn't changed its spots that much. It's still trying to make out that Scotland's too wee uh, and too poor in order to do these things. Let me... Order. I don't know if Richard Simpson... I don't know Order. if Richard Simpson is aware of this. But the National Institute of Health Research funding that I just referred to is contributed to by the Chief Scientist exactly. Office in Scotland to the tune of £9 million every year. In other words, we contribute our share of funding to the pot in order that Scottish researchers can bid into it and get funding back. We don't get anything for nothing, even although Richard Simpson clearly wants to give the impression that we do. In terms of uh, one of the other three strands I spoke about, in terms of Chief Scientist Office Committee's funding, again, as Richard Simpson will be aware, this is a pot of money that researchers bid into. It fluctuates year on year. In some years, I've got figures here going back to 2005-06. In some years, we've seen that over £2 million. In one year, it was over £3 million. It sometimes goes down. It then goes back up again. It's a fund that is open for bids. And I hope we would all agree to encourage those doing vital research into mental health to bid for this funding, because the funding is there and we want it to be used. That is First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who live in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.